Amen. I've never heard so many people pronounce my name correctly in my entire life, just for the record. Uh, go ahead and turn to James chapter 2. Keep a bookmark in Proverbs chapter 14. We'll get back there in a second. We're going to uh, do a quick little Bible study before we get into um, the sermon. I want to clear something up um, real quickly. Turn to James um, chapter 2. So James chapter 2 um, is a pretty popular uh, misunderstand, misunderstood um, chapter in the Bible where a lot of people think it's teaching works um, righteousness or works salvation, works-based salvation, when really it's talking about being profitable um, to your brother. It's talking about how we can be profitable. Specifically, if you look down at James chapter 2 and look at verse number 15, the Bible says, you know, it gets pretty specific here. It talks about our brothers and sisters. It said, if a brother and sister... A brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? So what profit are you if you don't help that person that's in need? So this is what I want to get at um, this morning. Um, brother Ray didn't have a tie on this morning, and the reason Brother Ray did not have a tie on is because I am wearing Brother Ray's tie. <laughs> So it was the first time in 23 years that I packed my own suitcase, and I didn't pay attention um, to detail, apparently, because I forgot to put a tie in. And it was funny because um, I mentioned to the guys this morning, I was, you know, I, I like to be ready and organized, and I didn't have a tie. I didn't want to come to the church looking like a slob that didn't wear a tie, and especially preaching here. And uh, I told, I texted Brother Ray, and he's like, for sure, I've got a tie for you. And he hands me this tie. I didn't, I didn't notice that he wasn't wearing a tie himself. And he hands me this tie. And I went to the bathroom at the hotel to put the tie on. And you can tell when a tie's been recently tied. And I'm like, what, man, what did they, like, take this tie off of some guy? <laughs> they go into, like, a Pentecostal church and take a tie from somebody and give it to me? Either way. Anyway, thank you, Brother Ray. The point I'm trying to get at is Brother Ray is profitable. So he's not backslidden. He's profitable. Okay? All right. Now let's get back to uh, Proverbs chapter 14. Um, just keep your place there. So um, to give you a little bit of an introduction on this morning's sermon, I just had a birthday. So, you know, thank you. Just stop. <laughs> I had a birthday on June 1st. Um, I turned 45 years old. Okay, I turned 45. And now I planned to live to about 90. So I figure that I'm middle-aged. You know, if you want to do the math on that, I am now middle-aged. So I'm thinking... Maybe I'm due for a midlife crisis, is what I'm thinking. Now let me ask you just an honest raise of hands. Who has seen someone or witnessed someone in their life that they believe to have gone through something that they believe to be a midlife crisis? Just raise your hand. So, I mean, this is a pretty um, popular thing. So, I mean, I figured I'd preach a sermon on this since, you know, maybe I'm due for one. And let's look at it. Um, this evening, okay? So let me first define, let's, let's look at Wikipedia. That's where all truth is on the internet, right? <laughs> Wikipedia. So Wikipedia says this about a midlife crisis. A midlife crisis is a transition of so, a, a identity crisis and self-confidence crisis that can occur in middle-aged individuals, typically from 45 to 65 years old. The phenomenon is described as a psychological crisis brought about by events that highlight a person's growing age, inevitable mortality, and possible lack of accomplishments in life. Now, I generally agree with this, and I've generally, I've seen, I'm kind of joking about myself having a midlife crisis, but I've seen several people in my life go through midlife crises. So, I generally agree with this assessment. Now, basically, I mean, I'm going to come at this again, sorry ladies, from a man's perspective, but um, this pretty much applies to anyone in their life um, this evening. You know, most midlife crises that I have seen have been men. And that's just the nature of where I've worked, the circles um, that I've been in. And I believe that, especially in our circles, most midlife crises um, will be men as well. Ladies, you're blessed, and I'll explain that later um, in the sermon. But the typical causes, if you go look up typical causes on psychology.com or, you know, all these uh, internet site sites, the causes are this, you know, finances, that's a category. Career, you know, basically people, they, they get to... 45 or 60 or whatever, and they're like, I just don't have enough money. I thought I would have more money than this. And it just, you know, it, everything comes crashing down for them. Their career, this is, a very, this is probably the one I've seen the most. 
is where you have a man that, you know, turns a certain age and he just, he thought he should have been further. He thought he should have been at the top of some ladder or the top of some chain that he was, was looking up at for 20 years, 30 years, or whatever it was. The fourth category is kind of dumb, in my opinion, physical changes. You know, as if, you know, as if you think like, oh man, I'm 50 and I don't look like I'm 20. It's like, all right, you know, are you like, are you still a child? I mean, why do you think that that's something that you should expect? And then, of course, family changes, divorce, et cetera. I've seen um, that one as well, unfortunately. So let me just give you kind of a trend of, of what I've seen before we get into uh, Proverbs. But basically, I've seen men, they start off, you know, this is kind of the trend that I've seen. They start off in life really ambitious, right? They're really ambitious. They, they start a career, they start a craft, they start a trade, they start some job, and, you know, maybe they go into that job, maybe they stare at a cubicle for 10 years, you know, maybe they, maybe they get a promotion, maybe they miss a promotion, you know, maybe they get some, you know, they, then they stare at the wall for another 10 years or so. Then, I mean, this is a really big one that I, that's triggered uh, midlife crises that I've seen. Maybe they get laid off from that job. Look, I'm not trying to trigger any crises here tonight, okay? But then they just realize that, you know what, I'm getting older, and I'm not in my prime anymore, and is this, is this it? You know, is this it? I actually, I actually knew an engineer. He, he got laid off when he was about 40, and he literally moved to Nicaragua to live in a hut. And, like, I have not, I have not seen him since. And it's not... Not, I don't know if he's still there or other people have heard from him, but I was, I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just going to go and I'm just going to live a simple life in a hut. And he just kind of like, I mean, he kind of sort of lost his mind to a lot of people um, that we're looking at. But look, this, this happens to people. You know, this happens to people. So let's look it down at Proverbs chapter 14. Let's see if we can avoid this <laughs> in our lives, okay? Let's see if we can avoid this. Here's the first problem. Okay, look at Proverbs chapter 14. And look down at verse number 23. So look, the problem that, that men have, unfortunately, is men define themselves by what they do. I, I, I do this all the time. If you see a, a group of men get together and talk and introduce each other, one of the first questions that you'll hear asked is, what do you do? Because men, they define who they are by what they do. You know, whether that's, you know, a, a job, a career, worldly goals, whatever that is. But, you know, that's the first issue right there, is that they define themselves by those things. Look down at Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 23. The Bible says here, it says, in all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. So look, the, the Bible in Proverbs, you know, a lot of Proverbs are opposites. So they say in the verse, they'll say one side, and then they say the other side of the coin in the same verse. It's, 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 it's brilliant, really. And, and, and this is one of those cases. The Bible here is saying, in all labor there's profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Penury meaning poverty. Okay, so what the Bible here is trying to convince um, you in Proverbs 14, 23 is, is to work, is to, to labor. It's trying to convince you that that, you know, hey, choose labor, get to work, is what the Bible is, is saying here. So, you know, for the kids, for the young people in the room, I was just having a conversation with a, with a young man just before the service. Here's kind of what you have to understand. It doesn't really matter what you do. And don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, hopefully you and your parents, you know, you know your strengths, you know your interests, you know, things like that. But the thing is, all you are trying to do is provide for your own and, and, and fulfill that part of your covenant. It's just part of your covenant. You know, I don't want to say don't overthink it, but don't overthink it. Okay, because look, in all labor, there's profit. I knew a guy once that he, he, he couldn't hold a job, and it was, like, it was like literally for years. It was one every one month, every two months. It's just a different job, a different job, a different job. Because he's like, this one just isn't for me. No, this isn't what I was meant to do. This, not it. You know, just again and again and again, this guy just kept, he's just killing himself, looking for this perfect trade, this perfect career. 
I mean, at the end of the day, it was the labor that that guy didn't like. But my point is the same. In all labor, there is profit, the Bible says. Look, it's called, I mean, I tell my kids this all the time. I'm like, it's called work, not fun. You know, it's not like, see you kids, I'm going to fun. I mean, it's called work for a reason. I mean, the, the, the feminist lie that you need to go and, you know, throw off, you know, being a mother and a keeper at home to go chase this career. Look, it's work. It's work. It's called work and not fun for a reason. So the Bible says that in all labor there is profit. All you're trying to do is fulfill that part of the covenant that says that you're to pr provide for your own. That's all. That's that part of the covenant. Now, this is the key for the Christians. What you do for that part of the covenant should not define who you are. This is the key for us right here. As long as you are laboring, as long as you are providing, you're good. That, that's, that's what the Bible says. You know, that labor, that profit, I mean, whatever you're doing, whatever that trade is, I mean, because look, I mean, as messed up as this country is, sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit here, as messed up as this country is, if you go out and you work hard, you can still make it. I, I, I believe that. You go out and you work hard at, at whatever job it is or skill that you're learning, and all this, you can still make it in this country. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. So what is the, what is the let's get to the root cause of the problem. What is the root cause of the midlife crisis? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look down at verse number 17. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look down at verse number 17. The Bible says, charge them that are rich in this world. Don't be rich. Now, it's not even saying like, don't be rich. It's just saying, you know, the rich people in the world need to understand this, is what this verse is saying, is what this passage is saying. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in what? In uncertain riches, but in the living God, who what? Who give us, giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Ecclesiastes 3 says that, like, the good of our labor is the gift of God. So what the Bible here is saying is that, you know, the problem is that, you know, God gives us the riches that comes from that labor. The problem is, is that what people do is instead of realizing that it's the gift of God, they start to trust in that, in the riches. It, it, that's what this is saying. This is what this is warning against. It's trusting in those things that are the problem. It's realizing that, you know, they're not gifts of God. You know, forgetting that part and then trusting in those uncertain riches is the problem. Look, the riches are not the prize. The riches are not the prize. That is the key. Your job, your career, your trade, your craft, it has a purpose. And God, through that blessing, will give you things to enjoy. But it is not the prize and it should not define who you are. Because why? Because it's uncertain. That's why. Turn to Isaiah chapter 2. Let's look deeper at this. So, so what if I do define myself through those things? Because look, it's easy for people to fall into that. Is it not? Isaiah chapter 2. Look at Isaiah chapter 2 and look down at verse number 12. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse number 12. This is a great passage in the Bible because... Verse 13 through 16, it, it becomes our problem. I have brackets around those. I have brackets around verse 13 through 16, and my brackets in my Bible says the strength of man. In verse 13 through 16. But let's read it together. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. So the Bible here is saying that, you know, anybody that's proud and lifted up is going to be brought low. But look at verse 13. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, things, look, things men built, materials men used to build strong things, and upon every fenced wall, these defensible 
cities and forts, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, you know, these strong navies and strong fleets, strong vessels, and upon all the pleasant, pleasant pictures. He, he, the Bible here is talking about all the materials, the abilities, the powers of man here. And about how man, you know, they get lifted up because of these things. I mean, look, I just flew over, I just flew over L.A. at night. You ever seen that? My goodness, you can't see the whole thing. It, it's crazy. I've had some, I, I've been privileged to see amazing things that men can build on this earth. But the problem is, the problem is, is that God says that those things are, they're uncertain things. They're uncertain things. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. See, with the parable of the sower, the seed that fell upon the thorns, go to Matthew chapter 13 and look at verse number 22. You know, the, the seed that fell upon the thorns was the, the word that was sown, and then the deceitfulness of these riches, these uncertain riches, you know, it choked that word. It choked the word of God. Let's read it together. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world. There's the problem right there. And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and you become unfruitful. So here's the thing. This parable of the sower here is telling us that, you know, the care of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, it chokes the word. But here it's even worse. It's even worse if we look back to Isaiah chapter 2 because what the Bible is saying, so we can see that, that trusting these things, these things that cause these crises in people's lives, we can see that that will choke our spiritual life, the Bible is saying. It'll, it'll, it'll choke it out. It'll make it starve. It'll make it die. It's what the Bible is saying. But it's even worse because the cedars, the oaks, the ships, the pictures, the cities, the machines, the houses, the cars, the house that's not big enough, the car that's not good enough, the material things, the nicer things. You know, the, the, I wanted to be the boss by now. I wanted to be the boss's boss by now. Those things will literally drop you off a cliff. Because why? Because they're uncertain. That's why. So, yeah, they're going to choke your spiritual life. That's the first problem. But then they're going to drop you off a cliff on the other end. I mean, the Bible's warning us about these things, about trusting and caring in these things. I mean, why? Why are they going to drop us off a cliff? Because they go away. They go away. Amen. And, and, you know, Isaiah chapter 2 is saying, if you, if you who are profitable start to trust in those things, God's going to make those things go away. So that's a problem the Christian has uniquely. However, look, here's the thing. I mean, look, God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. Anything, especially this crew, anything that is stopping you from, you know, being spiritual, being fruitful, as Matthew 13 has said, God's, gonna, God's jealous of that. God's going to crush those things. That's what Isaiah chapter 2 is talking about. It, it, anything that gets high and lofty, God's going to bring low, Amen. is what he's talking about. Amen. But look, even aside from that, here's the thing, folks. Let me just give you some reality. There's good years and bad years. Anybody that's over 40 can tell you that. I mean, you know, I don't know. They say, oh, we're going into a recession. Oh, well, you know what? There's good years and bad years. There's always been good years and bad years. What do we do? Same thing we did last year. Serve the Lord. Amen. There's ups and downs with these things. Turn to John chapter 15. Turn to John chapter 15. There's good years and there's bad years. And there, there's going to be gift years and maybe years there's not as many gifts. You know, it's just a matter of, of recognizing that in our lives. You know, I mean, God's still on the throne in the bad years. Amen. Just as much as he is in the good years. Look at John chapter 15. In verse number one, but really for us, if we're not bearing fruit because of trust in these things, look at what John chapter 15, verse number one says, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, that's you, 
What does he do? He purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So that means, that means God's constantly looking for, for these things in your life. God's constantly looking for those thorns that are starting to wrap around your neck and choke the word for you. It's like, but I'm bearing fruit. That's why he's doing it. He's going to pare you down. Why? So you can bring forth more fruit. That's why. Look, you better fix those things if you're trusting in those uncertain things or God's going to fix it for you. Look, he's going to break up your ships. Isaiah 2 says. He's going to break up your navy. Whatever it is that you're trusting in that's aside from what you, you, know, what you should be trusting in, fix it or God will fix it for you is what he's saying here. Go to Proverbs chapter 8. Go to Proverbs chapter 8. Here's the key. Here's the key. Just as in all labor there's profit, look, all labor there's profit. Let's, let's start paring that down now. Look at Proverbs chapter 8 and look at verse number 19. Proverbs chapter 8, look at verse number 19. I'll let you turn there. I'm going to take a drink. My, uh, Proverbs chapter 8 and verse number 19. The Bible says in Proverbs 8, 19, it says this. God says, look, he says, my fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. Look, the Bible's saying that bearing fruit as a Christian is better than gold. I, I like to pay attention to all these, like, value statements in the Bible like this. There's a lot of them. And we'd be wise to just think about the value statements in the Bible. My fruit is better than gold. So what do people do? They trust in gold. But God says, my fruit is better than gold. I mean, the Bible says there's a lot of these value statements in the Bible, and so much pain and suffering would be saved in the Christian life if people would just pay attention to these value statements. In Proverbs 31, it talks about the virtuous woman being, you know, she has, she's, her value is, it's not rubies. She's not like the same as rubies. Her value is far above rubies. I mean, think about that. In Proverbs 22, it talks about a good name. I can't for the life of me figure out why more people don't care about that. A good name is better than great riches in Proverbs 22. Like these, are, these are things we need to pay attention to. Proverbs 16, wisdom, understanding, knowledge. Same, better than gold. And in Proverbs chapter 8, my fruit, he says. My fruit is better than gold. God is trying to stop the midlife crisis here. That's what he's trying to do. There's nobody that hears this that should be anywhere near a midlife crisis. How could it be better than gold, you say? Because it doesn't rust, it doesn't corrupt. Amen. Even better than that, go to Psalm chapter 1. Go to Psalm chapter 1. Go to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, look at verse number 3. Actually, look at verse number two, because this kind of fits in with what we were talking about this morning. Psalm chapter one and verse number two. The Bible says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. It's talking about uh, blessed is a man who has this characteristic, okay? Blessed is a man, and it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law doth he mediate, meditate, sorry, day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall, doth not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So like the water is like the word of God just like feeding us, right? And the Bible here says that like, you know, your leaf will, it will never wither. Because guess what? You're eternally secure. Amen. You're eternally secure. So you know what the beauty of, of being eternally secure is? You know, so you're, I mean, you're like, well, I'm never going to go to hell. That's pretty good. Yeah, I get it. But guess what? You know what else is eternally secure? Your fruit. Your fruit is eternally secure. Your fruit that you go out and you win to the Lord and you bear forth in this world is eternally secure just like you are. So here's the thing. I joked about, you know, living to 90, right? I mean, I, you know, just because it worked out with the math, you know. But here's the thing. I could drop dead tomorrow and my fruit's eternally secure. You could drop dead tomorrow and all your fruit that you've had for the whatever is eternally secure. No one could ever take that away. That fruit still remains. That fruit could remain for generations. 
If you do it right, dads, if you follow that through correctly. So we see how, how silly that this idea of the midlife crisis is, yet so many people go through it. I mean, ladies, you know, you're blessed because, you know, hopefully, you know, you're, you're doing what you were called to do in this life. I, before I became a pastor, I would always tell my wife about my secular job. I'd always say, like, your job is way more. And look, I believe this from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Her job is way more important than mine. I mean, she's raising our children. She's raising, she's teaching our children the Bible. I mean, she's, she's, she's doing what she is supposed to do with her life. That's what just, it just blows me away with these ideas of, of feminism attacking that. Because it's way more important than any career that I could have or any, any secular job that anyone could have is raising that next generation. It's, it's what they're supposed to do. Now, I have seen this with women where they buy the lies of feminism. And maybe they, they, they forego that or they put that in the back seat or whatever, and then they're in the same risk as the men that I've been talking to you about because it's the same theory. They're putting their trust in career, in uncertain riches, and they're just putting all those things all her, tr all her trust, all his trust, it doesn't matter, in things that are going to drop you off a cliff. So look, it doesn't make any sense for a Christian to have a midlife crisis. It doesn't make any sense at all. One, one thing, here's the great irony of the midlife crisis. And I often, I often talk about this out soul winning. If I, if I get somebody saved, I'll often spend um, several minutes with them after getting them saved just talking about the future of their life. And one thing that I ask people all the time is I always ask people, I said, okay, you know, this person's got saved, and, you know, I talk to them, and I say, okay, here's, here's a question I always ask. How many lives do you have? And, you know, unless they're a cat, they say one. <laughs> you know, and they say one, and I say, okay, would you like to waste that life? I've never had anyone say yes, they want to waste their life. But here's the great irony of the midlife crisis, okay? No one wants to waste their life, yet everyone is. That, that's, that's the irony of the midlife crisis right there. It's, it's the midlife crisis is people waking up to the fact that they're wasting their life. That's what it is. That's all it is. But then it gets, it gets, it gets stupid from there because it's a man. He wakes up and he's like, man, my ships are sunk. He's like, it didn't work out like I had it planned when I was 20. And, you know, I mean, for that guy, I'm like, okay, at least, at least better late than never that you realize that you've been, you've been wasting your time, putting your trust in the wrong thing. But then instead of fixing the problem, instead of going out and getting saved, getting in church, serving the Lord, you know, bearing that eternal fruit, they go and they buy a Corvette. <laughs> or whatever. Something, you know, something they, they can't afford. You can't, probably can't even, it's probably not even the car you can't afford you probably can't afford the car you can't afford anymore. <laughs> but the point is, they patch the hole with more, I mean, they patch the hole of wasted time with wasted money. Or stupid decisions. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. So this isn't for us. This isn't for us. I mean, if you could die by irony, though, I mean, seriously. Look, the prophet that should define you, remember all labor? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The prophet that should define you is the prophet that you impart to others that has eternal value. It's all about that eternal value, folks. And here's the thing. Here's another, here's another thing I just want to point out real quickly. The, the whole midlife crisis thing, it's really rooted in selfishness. It's really rooted in this idea that, you know what? I need to be a great man. You know what? I had this vision of me being this great man when I was 20, when I was 30, or whatever. But look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Somebody at lunch brought this verse up, and I didn't say anything today because I knew I was preaching <laughs> tonight. So, sorry, guys. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse... 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse number 19. Look what Paul says. He says, For though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself servant unto all, 
that I might gain the more. You know what Paul says here? What, what, what's Paul talking about? In the, and we'll read the next few verses. But what he's talking about is, how can I have more eternal fruit? He's like, how can I do it? He's like, I want to have more eternal fruit. Look, this is a great man. This is a great man here. All he's trying to do is sit here and think about a methodology that he can bear more eternal fruit. That's what he's trying to do. And how he's doing it, how's he doing it? He's, he's saying, I need to be this big, powerful guy. I need to become chief of this or whatever. And he's like, no, I, you know, I'm servant to all. He's like, whatever these theories that we read in these next few verses, he said, I'm servant to all, though. And that's how he's going he's gonna to be better at what he's going to gain the more. Look at verse number 20. And under the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might, why? Gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law is without the law, being without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. He's talking about, you know, going to the Jews and then going to the Gentiles. He's like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fit in here and fit in there. I mean, uh, one of the guys brought up at lunch, a good idea here is, or a good uh, application is like learning another language, like learning a culture or a language or something like that to become as them. Why? So you can win them, so you can gain them. And then look what he says, to the weak became I as weak. Well, that doesn't really fit in to the midlife crisis right there. That's not really the, the guy that wants to be this big, powerful somebody or he wants to have his name known, you know, forever or whatever it is, or some lofty. It's, it's all rooted in selfishness is what I'm trying to get you to understand. Because Paul's only concern, as great of a man as Paul was, and as, I mean, look at the man. As great of a man as Paul was, all he was concerned about was what he could do to get more people one to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And this I do for that. Why? Look at verse 23. This I do. Why? This I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. He's saying all these things. I'm going to be servant to all. I'm going to go and I'll learn languages or I'll learn cultures or whatever. He's not talking about sinning in their culture or whatever he's doing. He's just saying all these things for the sake of the gospel. That's it. There's no him. There's no power. I mean, the man was in prison when he wrote a lot of his letters. He wasn't about that. So look, turn to Psalm chapter 90. Turn to Psalm chapter 90. Turn to Psalm chapter 90. The guy that went without a tie today. That guy was a servant today. You know, so some guy that forgot his tie could have a tie. I mean, it's a small example, but you see what I'm saying? It's not, it's not about, you know, it's not about like, no, I'm not going to go in there without a tie. Good luck with that. You know, I hope you're warmed. But look, it's about being a servant. That's it. And then you have more of that eternal fruit. Look at Psalm chapter 90. Look what the Bible says. Psalm chapter 90, look at verse number 12. So what do we do? Psalm chapter 90, verse number 12. The Bible says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. You say, I, I want to I spend my time profitably. I don't want to go down this road of, of, you know, trusting uncertain things and, you know, risking having some kind of crisis like this. The Bible is saying, you know, number our days. Number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So number, number them. So like, say I was going to live to 90. I'd number all my days up to 90. And like, you know, so 45 is halfway. And then up to 90, there's another 45. But look, it doesn't matter. There's nothing I can do about the 45 that, was already, that are already gone. That's what the Bible is saying here. It doesn't matter what has happened. All that matters is what is going to happen. You see? So don't waste more time. So if you sit there and you're like, you know, I, I've wasted some time. Look, I've wasted time. I wasted a lot of time in my life. Just don't waste more time. You know, number your days and figure out what you're going to do. And look, I mean, a good way to prolong your days is to be this fruitful person that God looks down on and says, look at all that profit down there. I'm going to keep that guy around for a while. That's a good way to, I mean, that's my theory. You don't have to, that's my method. That's the one I'm running with. I'll let you know how it works out. If I die in a plane crash tomorrow, I'll just don't go with that one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But the point is, is like you want God looking down on you. This is like the opposite of what he did in Isaiah 2. Okay, you don't want God to look, you want God to look down on you and say, this guy's got his priorities straight. This gal's got her priorities straight. There's just profit everywhere. 
There's just profit everywhere. I'm going to keep them around for a while. Because obviously we don't know how many days we have left. Turn to Luke chapter 9. Turn to Luke chapter 9. So the midlife crisis, I, I don't know why I've seen it so many times. It, it's, it's, it's largely unsaved people. We have no excuse. There should be no midlife crisis amongst the saved at all. I mean, we should be, you know, you're like, well, I'm not, you know, I don't feel like I'm doing, well, then do what you're supposed to do. You know what you're supposed to do. Look at Luke chapter 9 and verse number 62. Again, I mean, Jesus is just like, quit focusing on looking backwards. Jesus says in verse number 62, he says, Jesus said unto him, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Don't look back. Then go to, verse, uh, go to Ecclesiastes 7. Don't look back. I mean, I, I kind of think about, you know, people that get depressed about their past and things like that. It, it's kind of like somebody who was lost in the woods and they found a map or somebody gave them the map and they said, hey, here's a map and a flashlight and the direction out is that way. And they just sit down with the map and they sit down with the flashlight in the middle of the woods and they cry. It's like, that doesn't make any sense, but that's what people do. Just because they wasted some time in their life. You know, big deal. Don't waste any more. Don't look back there. It's okay. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And the Bible even gives us even more encouragement in verse number 8 of Ecclesiastes 7. It says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Look, the Bible says, and, and it's not easy to do either. Go, go study up the kings and see how many ended well. I mean, some of them started well, but very few started well and ended well. Go, go, go just, you know, I think, I think I actually did the math on it. It's like 4% or something. But it's very, very low, okay? That, but guess what? Ending well is better, is what the Bible says. Ending well is more important then starting well. And so, look, be thankful for that. Be thankful that ending well is better. So, look, it, it's, it's, the message is a simple one tonight. You know, if you see people that are having a hard time, you know, getting older, and, you know, then it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not an issue with age. It's not an issue with age. It's an issue with where they're putting their priorities, their trust, and, you know, they're trusting things that are uncertain. That's why they're getting shaky as they get older. That's why. And, and all the unsaved people out there that have midlife crises and will continue to have them, I think I, think I know some people that have had several of them. I'm, some people I'm thinking it's just a reason to go buy a car. <laughs> but there's some people out there that they just go out there and they just, like, they just keep wasting their time. And they keep wasting their life. And it's just like you're trying to beg these people. That's why we need to beg these people that we get saved. We need to tell these people, hey, you got one life, man. Use it for something. Amen. You know, I mean, everybody that you go and, I mean, not everybody, but the vast majority of people that you go and you give the gospel to, they are not the only one in that house at that time. Think about this. And then you give them the gospel and they, they got it and they're saved. Hey, would you like to be a prophet to your kids? Would you like your life to matter for your children? Because here's another question that no one will ever say. You want your kids in hell? No one will ever say yes to that. <laughs> no one will ever, oh yeah, I do. Yet they just do nothing with their salvation. You know, I think, I mean, I just think all the time, like how can I be more persuasive to people to not do this, to not to be saved, to take that gift, put it in their pocket and walk past their family every single day and never take that gift out of their pocket and never be a prophet to anybody else. So like next time you see a midlife crisis, that's all you're seeing. You're seeing people that have wasted their life and are choosing to keep wasting it. That's it. Personally, I think I'll skip it. I think I'll skip it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for um, this church. I thank you for um, the people in this church, Lord, and I pray that you just help us to just bear that eternal fruit and just to, to remember that, I mean, no matter what happens, ups, downs, that it, it doesn't matter because our, our trust is in the eternal here. Lord, I, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to come here and, and fellowship and preach here 
and just be um, a small part of this ministry, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.